Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I plan to talk for about an hour, but I'm also happy to interrupt my talk with questions or comments or clarifications. And then we'll also have some time to chat at the end. So don't, don't hold back if there's stuff you want to say. And if, if we get off track, I'll make sure to get us back on track. Um, this, this talk is really designed to be a, an overview of the path that I've been on with my research um, over the course of my career. I promise it won't be like a trip down memory lane or anything like that. But I think it's really um, helpful sometimes in, in the kind of thinking about the current state of the field um, to take stock of the context in which that evolved. And in particular, I think we're at a, a juncture now where um, in psychology and education, neuroscience is increasingly playing a critical role in our understanding and at least in the public discourse um, of, of ways that we have the potential to move forward. And so I wanted to present the experience that I've had over the course of the last 30 years or so being in the field and thinking about these issues of if, if you're interested in how experiences shape development, um, in what way does neuroscience have potential to impact the work that we do to improve outcomes? And then also, what are some of the challenges and limitations inherent in those approaches? I want to start by acknowledging um, the various locations in this work is and has been and will continue to be done, including um, the University of Oregon, the Oregon Social Learning Center, where I spent a large part of my early career, um, and the Center on the Developing Child, where some of the concepts that we use most now in our work have really evolved. Um, and of course, I want to um, acknowledge the members of my lab, the Stress Neuro Neurobiology and Prevention Laboratory, or SNAP Lab, uh, which is now at Oregon. So I'm going to start um, by talking about the evolution of the interventions that we developed um, to support and promote healthy development in children in the context of early adversity. Then I'm going to talk um, more about sort of how that's led us to really embrace this approach that we're referring to as translational neuroscience. It turns out translational neuroscience is a term that gets pretty broadly applied in a variety of different fields, um, including molecular biology, as well as systems neuroscience and a, a number of other areas. So there's some sub specific definitions that we apply that I think are worth noting. Um, but be, be forewarned if you start using the term. Some people will think you're talking about something completely different. Um, and then I want to talk about some of our current and future directions. Our work evolved and continues to evolve in the context of a cycle that I think is too infrequently embraced in the field. That is, the idea that it's cyclical and iterative um, is really not something that, at least in terms of early childhood and interventions in early childhood, is how people think. But we really construe our work as being ongoing um, cycles in which research has the potential to inform theory, theory has the potential um, to inform practice. And then research can again be invoked to understand and validate theories and to then subsequently refine practices. And if you see this not as um, kind of a, a serial and finite process that has a start and an end, but an ongoing process, I think that will both help un you understand how we've progressed in our work, but also, I think, a, a viable pathway for thinking about how research can contribute to addressing the needs of high adversity families in general. Um, so to, to do this, you do have to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane back to the 1970s, um, just because it's important to recognize that at that time, a lot of what was understood about um, how challenges emerge, emerge especially um, antisocial and acting out behavior, disruptive behavior in families, was largely the result of um, anecdotal information and kind of questionnaire surveys that had been um, that were the primary means of collecting data in the in the field and the big um, innovation at that time, which occurred in a number of places, including here at Stanford as well as up in Oregon at the Oregon Social Learning Center, was to conduct. Um, observations of families in their natural environment, and then to gather information about what was actually happening in a more objective way using microsocial coding and other approaches. Um, that work, combined with um, 
the collection of data longitudinally to understand what might be happening early on that was associated with problems later on really was transformative from the idea that we might understand from correlational research um, what kinds of risk factors might be associated with the development of disruptive behavior to more causal models um, where we could really understand the processes inherent in risk factors that might lead to um, the, the disruption of the basic processes that were more centrally involved or causal mechanisms in developing antisocial behavior. And in particular, work by Patterson and colleagues that's been replicated in many other places was very instrumental in showing that a lot of what we had determined as risk factors, things like poverty and discrimination, parental depression and substance use, were predictive of subsequent disruptive behavior in children to the extent that they impacted the parenting practices within families. And that in particular, that to the extent that parents were observed to be using low rates of, depending on your theoretical perspective at the time, or warmth and responsiveness, or contingent responding, and high rates of harsh discipline, um, and not a close monitoring of children in terms of paying attention to what was happening moment to moment, that those things were what were the, the most sort of central predictors of subsequent disruptive behavior. So, it was not to say, it was not to discount the importance of the more distal factors, but distal factors in and of themselves were predictive to the extent that they were associated with increases in negative parenting and decreases or lower rates of positive, warm, responsive parenting. One of the things that was particularly instrumental about that um, insight was that the core parenting practices that were identified as kind of the mechanism were potentially malleable. That is, they were things that could potentially be changed through supportive interventions. And um, this is, is an insight that many people have had, and, and, and not just in um, developmental psychology, but in many other disciplines. One of the things that's really critical about identifying a core mechanism or more hypothesized mechanism that's malleable is that if you design an intervention to affect that core malleable variable and you actually are able to show that changes in that variable or those variables are associated with changes in outcomes, not only do you have a nice, effective, potentially impactful intervention, but you also have support for the underlying theory. And it's, it's support from an experimental paradigm, so it's more powerful in many ways than just straight correlational evidence. And that really is what um, the first generation of intervention research in the, in the general area of parent training or parent management training produced was a suite of, of interventions. Um, some of them evolved at the Oregon Social Learning Center, like parent management training. Others evolved in other places, parent-child interaction therapy that uses um, video, or rather uses a bug in the ear coaching technique um, to, to help parents learn these kinds of skills. Triple P, um, there are a number of programs, the incredible years, that all employ these strategies of helping parents to engage in the positive supportive behaviors that are predictive of positive outcomes and use lower rates of harsh, negative, and inconsistent discipline. And across numerous studies now, RCTs, what's been found is that these approaches are effective at impacting parenting behavior, and by doing so, that you see subsequent decreases in child disruptive behavior. So it's a nice sort of test of the overarching model, and it's produced a number of very effective interventions. And I, this is uh, just, just for the, the um, computational, methodologically inclined people in the room. Um, this is a, a slide from a, a study that was done um, by Mark Eddy and Patty Chamberlain. It was uh, published in JCCP in 2000. Um, and what I really want you to focus on is the, at the center of this slide is an intervention trial. Um, and what you can see is that group assignment, either to receive, in this case, a therapeutic foster care intervention that provided support in these parenting practices, um, and those were deemed mediators, that those, um, that changes in those particular mediators, in supervision and discipline, uh, in the quality of the relationship, and in, in this case, because it was adolescence, association with uh, peers with similar kinds of problem behaviors, those were what accounted um, for the variance in the group assignment in reducing antisocial behavior. So it's a nice, again, indication of if you target 
the core mechanism and you're able to see changes in that mechanism, that that should, according to the hypothesis, the hypothesis lead to changes in the outcome. And in the case of this outcome, what was so promising and noteworthy was that this was a study of kids who had chronic problems of delinquency, who had had 10, 15 arrests, and many of them felony arrests before they were involved in the program, and this dramatically decreased the rate of rearrest and subsequent problem behavior. So nice proof of concept. Um, when I arrived at Oregon, which was for graduate school, that, that um, developmental trajectory from early childhood through adolescence had been being studied for a long time there and elsewhere. Um, but interestingly, and to, from, from my experience somewhat ironically, the primary focus of the intervention research there at that time was on adolescence. Um, that, that was a, a population where there was great need, there was funding to support work, um, and people had gravitated towards, towards that age group as, a, as an age group in particular need. But from my perspective, a lot of my, my work when I was in graduate school was both in research and in the clinical area. And in working with youth who had these histories of chronic delinquency, it became readily apparent that their problems hadn't started when they reached middle school or started high school, um, that the problems dated back to very early on. And it seemed crazy to me that we were dedicating and investing so many resources in trying to solve problems so late in the game when kids had had so many challenging experiences um, when there was a very clear developmental path that we could focus on and this is basically, you know, it was not a brilliant insight on my part. It's the justification for the whole field of early intervention and why people think they should intervene early. Um, but it's certainly how I came to the idea that we should be focusing on infancy and early childhood uh, as, as a core area to make a difference. And so um, with my colleagues in 1996, we developmentally extended downwards this therapeutic foster care program um, and created a program this is a, definitely a, an important takeaway from the talk, which is do not let scientists name your intervention for you, or they'll come up with names like multidimensional treatment foster care for preschoolers, which was the name we gave it. Um, but it was an approach that was designed to essentially provide the same kinds of supportive services that were being done in, in the slide that I showed you previously, but uh, adapt them for children in the three to five-year-old age group. And um, among the things that we um, did to adapt um, was to, to introduce a component that was a school readiness component um, because we realized even if we were helping children's be behavior stabilize in the home, that it was still likely that children would have challenges um, when they got to school. This was also, in ways that I'll explain, our first um, attempt to incorporate biomarkers into intervention research. So it's sort of the first place where we began to see the value of doing so. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, this schematic shows an overall representation of what this intervention involved. And I won't go through the details. The real sort of important message here is that this was, as you can tell, not a light touch intervention. This was an intervention where we felt like if we were going to impact these really high risk children in very adverse settings, that we needed to cover the basis. So we provided support for the caregiver-child relationship, for their case management issues. We addressed child individual needs. And you can see we had a whole team of, um, of staff that worked on these cases, which was a very effective approach, um, but also had major implications in terms of the potential sort of large-scale impact of the, of the program in the long term. Um, it, the studies that evolved from there, from, from the, the um, evaluation of the treatment foster care model, which were done over a 10-year period, um, really did provide continued support for a lot of the ideas around um, how you can impact child outcomes by addressing caregiving factors. Um, we found a lot of positive things, including fewer disruptions um, from foster care, um, we found increased attachment security, which was noteworthy because it's not an attachment-based intervention, but the children still showed greater propensity to seek a caregiver proximity when distressed. Um, one of the most um, policy-worthy findings that we uh, discovered was that there, there's, in general, um, this gradient for children in foster care of all ages, which is that the number of prior placements that they've had is directly associated with the likelihood that they'll find 
or that they won't find a permanent placement. So as kids have had more placements, they're more likely to remain in foster care and continue to bounce around. And in the context of this intervention, we completely mitigated that risk. So we were able to, to show that whether children had a few or a large number of prior placements, that there was virtually no likelihood that, um, that they would disrupt from the subsequent um, placements, the long-term placements, up to 24 months after a permanent placement was made. And that also gave us an idea that if, you, if resources are precious, that the place to be spending resources for young children in foster care is at the high end of this continu continuum where children have had so many prior placements. Um, as I said, this was our first foray into biomarkers research. And in a lot of ways, when we began to do this, the reason that we started to do it was because we did not feel like we adequately understood what we were seeing in foster children um, according to the information that was available. The basic kind of parenting disrupts child behavior didn't help us understand why many of the children, when they came into foster care and were in subsequent very supportive environments, continued to struggle and continued to act as if they were unsafe. And there were other phenomena we observed, including the propensity for children who were really struggling in that way to sort of, it was almost as, as, as if there was a kind of a switch that was flipped. And we saw rapid developmental progress in these children. And in seeking to understand that and looking for tools, I began to think about the neuroendocrine system as a potential mechanism that might be driving why the children um, were struggling at first and what might be changing. I was lucky enough to connect with Megan Gunner and a number of other researchers at that time who were really generous in providing mentorship. Um, and it really led us to rejigger the, the way we think about our conceptual models as an adaptation of what I had sort of been saying before about targeting core mechanisms. So in the context of biomarkers, we can ask similar kinds of questions along the lines of which neurobiological systems are affected by specific classes of experiences. So how do we see these particular biological systems being disrupted, not in general, like adversity causes all bad things, but are there particular experiences more associated with negative outcomes? Um, mediated through what kinds of subsequent experiences that might be malleable in the children's environments to produce specific kinds of outcomes. And when you posit your research, again, along these lines that are a conceptual model um, that targets mediating mechanisms through intervention, then you have the ability for intervention trials to serve as tests of those theories. And that's exactly what we did. So we, we examined the extent to which the treatment foster care intervention for preschoolers might ultimately affect children's outcomes by changing parenting behavior and ultimately having a, a subsequent impact on stress neurobiological systems. The particular system that we focused on in that first series of studies was um, the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis, which is the system that produces cortisol. Cortisol is a neurohormone horm hormone that helps um, with the regulation of stress. Um, it does so in a number of different ways. It mobilizes metabolic resources. It also stimulates the immune system. Um, one of the interesting characteristics of cortisol is that in addition to having a, a production in response to stress, it also shows a, a, a diurnal pattern of productivity where typically this is an oversimplification, but in most individuals what you see is highest levels slightly after awakening that decrease over the course of the day. At the time that we started studying children in foster care, most of what was thought to be a disrupted diurnal pattern was the pattern that you see up here. That is, if you're under conditions of stress, what you'd expect to see is that the HPA axis would be activated chronically and you'd find high levels of cortisol throughout the day. Um, in working in collaboration with Megan Gunner and others who were actually studying kids who were, had been adopted following institutional rearing in highly neglectful contexts, um, both we and our colleague Mary Dozier in Delaware and Megan and others um, who were so studying foster kids and post-institutional adoptees found an alternative pattern, which was diminished cortisol product productivity across the day, sort of a, a marker of um, what we were seeing in these children. And there's a, a tidbit there um, that we can pick up on when we're talking in Q&A. But it was, it's, it was interesting to us to identify that there was similarity between kids raised in severely neglectful 
institutional environments and kids in foster care, because previously we had thought kids end up in foster care because of physical and sexual abuse. And it turns out the majority of kids are in foster care because of high levels of neglect, and that it's really the absence of supportive of care that was the kind of phenotypic experience that seemed to be associated with these experiences in children raised in institutional settings and in kids in foster care. Um, so if you apply the conceptual model framework that I described previously to the context of our intervention, what we were saying was that the HPA axis, which produces cortisol, um, is potentially impacted by maltreatment and, and potentially experiences in foster care, but especially non-responsive early care. But, and, and that in particular, the, the in, inconsistent non-responsive caregiving seems to be the mediator of that, but that the, that in and of itself, as much as it might lead to problematic outcomes, can be the subject of interventions. And so that's what our intervention was designed to do, was to essentially increase the consistent uh, contingent parenting provided. As a result of, of th that investigation, we found some really interesting things, and they were somewhat unexpected. So rather than find that we were able to increase low levels of cortisol in general, and this has to, some, something to do with the statistics of, of central tendency, what we found was that in general, kids in our intervention condition actually showed typical patterns on average across time when we followed them across the, the course of the intervention for 12 months and looked a lot like a low-income community sample. And in contrast, kids in regular foster care were showing increasingly diminished morning cortisol across time. So they were actually losing their diurnal rhythmicity in their cortisol. Interesting to note that many of the kids in, in the treatment group that had low cortisol at the initial time points did show more regulated patterns across time but this is a story about variation as much as it is about central tendency. And so in fact, typically what we saw was that there was greater kind of stability of cortisol across time in the treatment group and greater diminished cortisol uh, in the intervention group. Um, we also found, and again, this is sort of some support for the conceptual model, that caregiver stress in response to children's behavior was what seemed to be driving the diminished cortisol over time in the regular foster care group, that uh, caregivers of children in regular foster care reported high levels of stress in response to ch children's problem behavior that remained high across time, um, and that that seemed to be what was really driving the diminished, or at least showed a strong correlation um, with the diminished cortisol that we were seeing in the children. So, the takeaway, at least at this point, was that we showed some support for the conceptual model in terms of the intervention having an impact on caregiving, having an impact on HPA axis, and on longer-term outcomes. There is a missing link in this, which I don't know if you picked up on, but it's an important one to note, and it's one that I think has been consistent in the literature, which was we didn't find that changes in HPA axis in the context of this study were associated with changes in children's behavior. So we saw behavior changes, behavior improving, and we saw HPA axis um, impact, but we did not see a connection between the two. Big challenge for the field, again, in terms of the, the utility of neurobiological measures. Um, the other takeaway from this is that in spite of the many wonderful ways in which this sort of showed up and there was validation of this as a potentially promising evidence-based intervention, including um, actually an economic analysis that showed that this saved money per child on the order of $3,000. Um, even though it cost money, there were a lot of net savings in the long run. There was virtually no uptake of this intervention in community settings following it becoming evidence-based. So we had great evidence base. We showed it to be cost-effective. We were able to demonstrate for whom it might be most effective, specifically children who had had the most placement disruptions. And there have been a handful of implementations of this in community-based settings, most of them in the Netherlands and other places in Europe rather than in the US because of our high investment in early intervention. Um, so that led us to really question what might be going on. And in fact, I think it also was a big awakening for me at that point in my career along the lines of you can build something that you think is the perfect thing, and especially put as many resources as you might need into doing what's necessary. And there might be no market for it in the sense that there might not be any system in which it has potential to be implicated. And then, you know, it
discussed in scientific journals and gets dragged out at times like this when people give talks. And that's the end of the story. And that's very unsatisfying, especially if you're in the business not to publish papers but to impact kids. So round two, um, we took what we learned um, at, from this first very intensive intervention. And I mentioned that we had a play group in that intervention. It occurred to us that maybe what we should do um, in this next iteration was to develop a program around school readiness that was much lighter touch. My colleague Catherine Pears and I were largely involved in doing this. Um, and you know, this is like anybody who, who does school readiness um, and who's done so for the past 10 or 15 years will say that you know, literacy and numeracy are not the only game in town. You need to do self-regulation and executive functioning skills. Um, and that was the foundation around this intervention uh, and how it was built. And um, th th perhaps the, the other thing that was, I think, distinguishing about this approach was that we were really looking to, to think about how we could have the maximum impact and build something that could be implemented in a more realistic way. And so our, our, the research was showing at that time and continues to that the time when children typically fall behind the most is during the summer. Um, and when, when they're, especially in the context of high risk, low resource settings, um, when kids are typically idle. And so what we thought to do was to introduce this program to fit into the summer right before kids started kindergarten um, and provide the kind of supportive care in the context of the kindergarten that was um, most useful to move things along and also to have a, a very light touch approach to supporting um, parents with the, with the kind of parenting strategies that we talked about. We've run subsequently three RCTs. The first one, which I'm going to be focusing on the data from, um, involved kids in the foster care system. Um, there was some sense that this might be of interest to community members and had, have greater potential because the local developmental disabilities agency asked to implement it, and then the local school district that serves largely low-income kids did as well. So there have been three RCTs. Um, and I won't belabor the, again, the, the interesting results in terms of just the general outcomes, but suffice to say that the longitudinal data has shown nice positive outcomes in terms of things like kids' literacy and numeracy and social emotional functioning across time, um, as well as parenting. And again, there's a, this is a little bit of a similar kind of a conceptual model where what you can see is that the mediators at least of um, some of the more negative long-term outcomes for kids in terms of them, them associating with other rascally kids um, was mediated through changes in self-competence, which was one of the major classroom targets. Um, see more direct effects uh, from the intervention itself on some of the other um, school behaviors. Um, in this iteration, we um, expanded our focus from cortisol to begin to look at children's executive functioning. Um, and this was a, a little bit more, again, if we're moving towards how do you develop more viable, scalable approaches, we're also zeroing in on particular um, areas to focus in on that the neuroscience was telling us we should really be looking at. Um, and this was a collaboration with Nathan Fox, um, who is as generous as Megan in helping us learn and understand and, and work on the methodology. Um, we were particularly interested um, in children's uh, response to corrective feedback in the context of classroom type behavior. Um, and Nathan had developed uh, a version of the flanker task that involved using colors. And can I just see a show of hands for people who are familiar with the flanker task? So I know, OK. And it, you're all up front. That's interesting. OK. Um, the flanker task is a task that asks um, uh, participants to essentially focus in on a central stimuli when there are other stimuli around it that have potential to be distracting. And the version for children is simplified so that essentially what it is is a button box that the child holds. This is now my six foot five son, Henry, when he was a lot younger. Um, the, they're instructed that a colored circle is going to come on the screen right above the white dot and that they should push the button that's the same color as the, as the circle that's right above the white dot. You can see that in congruent trials, it's a lot easier because all the dots are, or all the circles are, are one color. In incongruent trials, it's harder, and so you have to screen out and kind of withhold the impulse to push the button that's the other color. 
One of um, Nathan and his student, Jen Martin McDermott's um, insights was that if you really want to understand how children are, are understanding this task, that they actually need to be given feedback because they may not know whether they've made mistakes or not. So a, a smiley sm face or found, frowny face came on the screen in response to um, the, whether they made a correct or incorrect response. And um, this chart shows a time-locked uh, response in response to both correct and incorrect responses. And this was uh, the amount of electrical activity recorded at the frontal central area of the, of the scalp, so essentially above the prefrontal cortex. Um, what I want to highlight about this is the difference between the amplitude of the response in response to correct versus incorrect. And in particular, you can see that right here, there's an enhanced amplitude. It's in a negative direction of physiological response uh, in response to incorrect feedback or inc an incorrect response. That, that's called feedback-related negativity, and it's what you'd expect to see. When we looked at kids in the foster care sample, this is what we saw, which was there was no distinction in the amount of electrical activity that we saw, regardless of whether they made a correct or incorrect response, so no differentiation. Which, again, if you think about this in translational terms, one of the things that that suggests is often with kids from high adversity backgrounds, teachers will say, well, they make mistakes, and I tell them what they're doing wrong. They don't seem to notice. They don't seem to get back on track. I think they don't care. I think they're just, you know, they're not engaged. They don't, they don't really respond to teachers, don't seem to like relationships. This suggests that it may just be a question of the signal not getting through, that it may not be that there's recognition that there's corrective feedback coming on the part of the child, um, which would lead to expected not necessarily changes in behavior. What we found in the context of actually two studies, this is the more recent of them, um, is an intervention effect on feedback-related negativity, such that in the context of um, the intervention condition, you can see pre and post that you see very little differences between correct and incorrect responses. But following the intervention, the children in the intervention condition showed a healthy feedback-related negativity in response to corrective feedback. So this is change in brain activity um, on a laboratory task for kids who have been in a two-month intervention in a classroom helping them to sort of be more aware of cues and responses to what's going on in the, with the teachers. So it's kind of nice. Some, again, some indication of, um, of neurobiological plasticity and effects of an intervention. Um, more recently, we recently published this. Um, we actually did finally find, after 20 years or so, um, a mediational relationship between intervention and children's adjustment uh, at, on the first day of school that was mediated through um, the, the cortisol diurnal slope um, on that first day of school. So in fact, at least the, sorry, I didn't mean to wipe that away really quickly. So at least some indication in this case for support that changes in behavior might be mediated through changes, at least in neuroendocrine functioning. This, I want to point this out, that this is really our very first um, kind of intervention study that we found a connection between changes in a neurobiological system and su subsequent changes in behavior. And I think it's partially just because we're really just on the cusp of being able to become more precise and specific about what we should be targeting and how we should be targeting it. Um, but I also think it's a cautionary tale that as much as we may be enamored with what neuroscience can tell us, that at this point in time, we can't just say, well, changes in the brain are great, so they must be good in and of themselves, that we still need to understand better those linkages um, and continue to, to refine our models. Um, the other, again, just to return to where we were before, so KITS um, has done a little bit better. So it, it's an evidence-based intervention um, you know, that showed nice effects. Um, we subsequently did a, another economic analysis that showed that you save money um, based on the amount of money that's spent on special ed and kids missing school um, for kids who've been in the intervention. Um, has it been impacted or implemented at scale? A little bit better, but not a lot. So over the course of time, um, it's been implemented in about 70 classrooms. Uh, and has there about 1,000 children have been through the program. But it's been around for you know, 12 or 13 years now. So very, very slow growth. Um, this is another complicated 
uh, a complicated program to implement. It's quite costly. It's a lot less costly than treatment foster care, but it still involves dedicating a lot of resources to finding classrooms that kids can be in over the summer to transport them to those classrooms and so forth. Um, and so, um, again, I think this is, especially from a policy perspective, something that we have just too easily swept under the carpet, which is we can find efficacious approaches. Um, and I think it's sort of a two-part message. We can find efficacious, efficacious approaches um, and even have them be precise and theory-driven. And still, the strength of the experimental evidence may be not as strong as we would necessarily desire. So in and of itself, I would just be cautionary that evidence-based in and of itself is not like enough to go to Vegas on. Um, and that what it represents more than anything is a starting point for our work, but it in no way represents the finish line. I don't think that the current practice for scaling evidence-based interventions is really going to lead more to you know, improved um, effects or decreased decreases in some of the um, income achievement gaps that we see as so prevalent in early childhood, um, that in, a, in and of itself, the field is not producing sufficiently powerful um, programs. And even when the field does, um, the potential for them to be um, deployed on a wide scale basis is somewhat limited. So fortunately, that's not the end of my talk, or we'd all walk away depressed. Um, and I, I can also assure you that you know, 10 years ago, when we were starting um, on this kind of current cycle that we're on, um, this felt like it was pretty good. It was like, well, we should be pretty satisfied. We, after all, who has evidence that you can change brains? And who has evidence that you can um, improve the, you know, the likelihood that children in foster care won't disrupt? Um, but I've just become increasingly dissatisfied with sort of resting on those laurels when the impact is limited. And I, I'd be really interested as we move to discussion um, once I've kind of completed the, this third part of my talk, for us to collectively think about what, what next then? If, we, if we're not just going to say we're going to scale evidence-based interventions, then where does that leave us as a field? How do we move forward? And what are the various um, sources of ideas that could propel us beyond kind of, well, it's the best we can do. We're not medicine. We're not trying to cure cancer. Social problems are complicated. But like, you know, what are we, what are we going to do instead? Um, I think I'll just pause here partially so I can catch my breath and, and take a uh, sip of water, but also to see if there are any observations or reflections to this point, because I've kind of been rattling on. Yes? Yeah, this is a, that's a great question. I don't know if everybody heard it, but it was sort of like, well, if it didn't, if these things didn't take off, like, were you just sitting in your office at the University of Oregon going, when are they going to knock on my door? Um, or did we sort of seek out um, you know, questions um, or try to figure out why? The one thing that I, I really want to emphasize in this regard is that I, I think that we, I mean, in academia, at least in, in the world of academia that I live in, um, we're sort of allergic to like a business-oriented mindset or a more entrepreneurial mindset. And I think that's one of the things that's really been um, a constraining factor. And I don't mean by that that what we should have been thinking about was how to make big bucks selling these approaches. But what I do mean is we anticipated, in my mind, I can tell you from the very start, I thought my customer was children, um, children who were from high adversity backgrounds. I thought my customer, in the case of foster care, might be foster parents um, who needed support and couldn't find it. Um, in the case of um, kits, I thought my customer, again, might be the children and their families or might be the teachers. But if you think about this from a more sort of business-oriented perspective, those are the re potential recipients and beneficiaries, but they're not paying for the services. 
And that was the, like the, the thinking error was if this is of value to people, someone will pay for it. Someone should pay for it, and therefore it'll happen. That was the, that was the flaw. So I, I do want to be clear. That it was not that we did this and it worked, but nobody liked it. Foster parents you know, have consistently found that the kind of support that's available is something that's really not typically available to them. And teachers love having the tools that this program provides. So it's not that it's not acceptable to those who might be potential beneficiaries. It's that we had no like consciousness of how these programs would be ultimately resourced um, in the long run. And it turned out that in that, and again, in sort of these crass terms, there was no market for it. Um, that's probably not true in all areas, but in the context of early childhood, um, it's certainly a big issue is how do you design a program at least with some consciousness of how this program could be supported in the long run rather than just hoping that you can ultimately rely on people's goodwill or philanthropy to make it happen. That's a really risky proposition and I can certainly say that you know, the amount of time and effort and taxpayer dollars that goes into these programs um, to, to have that be the end result is, is kind of unfortunate. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot that can be learned, but um, it's definitely worth noting. Other comments? Yeah. So I'm just going to follow up on that and ask, is the problem just that you need better marketing for these programs, or are there deeper issues that you're going to have to? That's a good question. Do you have any thoughts about that? I don't want to bring people down, but I'd say there's probably deeper so it's not simply about like having a, a splashy logo or like a sales force that goes out and convinces people that they should do it. Yeah, I think there are um, there are a combination of issues, um, but I do think that the absence of consciousness of the kind of where would this ultimately fit um, in the design process is a significant rate limiting factor for the early childhood field. So I would, I would totally agree with you. And I would say looking at structural issues around why people don't fundamentally support early childhood, why they should, how we can work to change that are really important things. And I would say um, we too often, at least in the worlds that I've been in, leave the question of scalability to an afterthought. I'm going after the evidence base, and then I'll figure that part out. Yeah, go ahead. I Right, so I, I'll just repeat the comment, which is her question, which is, you know, how much might uh, some of the the potential be impacted if you're mapping onto existing service delivery channels or systems, as opposed to kind of being um, alongside those, but being sort of a separate entity. Um, I, I just, I think that the issue is whether we think along those lines during the design phase, again, or whether we think, well, this is a standalone thing and it's up to the systems to figure out whether it would fit or not. When people are thinking, how, how could this potential innovative idea be delivered in a doctor's office when they're designing it, that's a lot easier than thinking the evidence base is that kids have to come to a play group twice a week for three hours in the middle of the day during the summertime, because um, that's what we did. And you know, so that's what worked. And so we have to figure out how to do that in your district. So, and interestingly, I think we as developers often say, well, you know, so, I mean, there have been instances where I've seen people approached with creative adaptations, like, well, we have an existing full day um, you know, summer program for kids that are starting kindergarten. Could we just put your program in place, um, you know, for two days a week in that context? And 
people can be, the developer's side can be really resistant to that, even though I think it's exactly that kind of synergy that needs to happen. So lots of different ways to think about how to design more strategically, um, and rather than say it's up, to, it's up to the world to change to accept my intervention, um, I think we should be, I, I want to be clear, I'm totally supportive of efforts to change the world and to increase investments in early childhood. But while we're waiting for that to happen, I think this is another thing to take into consideration. And so that's sort of, I'm going to segue into the final part of what I wanted to talk about, which is how some of those um, experiences with the first two strategies that we developed um, and pursued using um, the approaches that I talked about um, have informed this latest generation of our work. And I mentioned earlier we sort of have, have used this translational neuroscience framework um, to construe a lot of what it is that we're doing. Um, really what this is about is the example that I gave of the lack of electrical response of the brain in response to corrective feedback that we see in high adversity kids. It's a nice example of how this strategy can be useful. So here's a basic kind of neuroscience finding that we had. And the question might be, how do we design a program in order to maximize the likelihood that children will be responsive to corrective feedback if our idea is that it's not that they're just willfully disregarding it or don't care, um, but rather that we need to increase the salience of it. And so you know, people talk about this as like a noise reduction versus signal enhancement. Now, Helen Neville's lab has talked about this a lot. Um, but how do you make information that might otherwise be kind of falling by the wayside more salient? If, you're, if that's what is the focus of your design, then you're essentially going back through that process that I described earlier of thinking about what are the malleable, potentially malleable mechanisms and how you might get at them and whether that might lead to subsequent changes. So that is sort of the, the core of how we think about this translational neuroscience approach. The other thing that's, um, and again, I don't think this is specifically neuroscience based, but it's really a critical aspect of the work that we're doing is if we think that the potential to impact uh, the, the effects of interventions can be increased, uh, one of the ways that we have to go about doing that is by looking at individual differences in response to programs um, that we deploy. That is to say, again, a lot of the science to date has said this, is, this approach is viable because on average, it produces a significantly greater response to something than some alternative strategy that's employed. But within, and you guys all know this, within any kind of sample, you're going to find a lot of variation around the mean. And what we've done in the context of the intervention and prevention worlds is to really sweep that under the carpet. It's like, well, on average it works, so that's good enough. And we, what we have not done is to think a priori, just like we should think a priori about customers, we should think a priori about potential moderators. If we're not thinking upfront about what are the person-based, what are the place-based variables that have potential to impact whether children and families are more likely to benefit from this approach or not, or if we at least don't examine that after the fact, then we're stuck with having to accept that all we can say is that on average this works. And we're ignoring the whole sector of the distribution where we didn't see positive effects. So another way that this approach has to come into play is by attending to variation in impact and setting that up as an opportunity to learn how to make interventions more effective for those for whom they're not working rather than just trying to sort of do a lot of smoke and mirrors around the non-responders. Um, I also think this approach, and this gets at some of the comments that have been made, it's not necessarily um, the case that this approach is only helpful for um, existing, or for, sorry, for novel intervention strategies that maybe people want to try out. Um, but this approach can also be helpful with existing interventions that are kind of black box models at helping to disentangle uh, 
what some of the active ingredients are. So there's lots of potential with approaches that are really widespread and already being widely implemented to use these kinds of approaches to understand what are they really getting at in the work that's being done. And again, I think therein has the potential um, to really have a greater impact um, from the work that we do. Um, so this final piece of my presentation is about the intervention that we've been working on um, since 2012. Um, my colleague Mel Melanie Berry, as well as some other folks in Oregon and I developed this approach. It's a video coaching um, program. Um, we um, decided to begin to move in this direction because, again, looking at what both the developmental research and neuroscience research has been showing over the past five decades, um, if you want to sort of leverage the single most influential factor in children's health and development, what you want to get at is parental responsiveness to children's behavior, especially early in life. The Center on the Developing Child at Harvard has produced a lot of materials um, about how critical this is in healthy development and healthy neurobiological development. Um, and the metaphor that they developed in connection and collaboration with the Frameworks in Institute was the idea of serve and return as being the core process that most centrally promotes healthy development. Um, serve and return is defined, at least in the context of our intervention, um, as being instances in which babies or children are exploring the world, are interacting with caregivers or looking at other things, pointing, um, and the, that, that was, is what we consider to be the serve, and the caregiver responds to the child and therefore returns the serve by acknowledging them, by sharing their focus, um, and mapping onto it. Um, we really were strongly influenced um, in the use of this approach by colleagues uh, from Sweden who had um, been trained in a particular type of video coaching called Marte Mayo, um, which exclusively focuses on instances in which children serve and caregivers naturally return the serve, identifying when that interaction, that servant interaction is happening and showing that back to children or back to the caregiver. So that may seem like sort of no big deal, um, but if you ever want a, a nice demonstration of how powerful this is, just look at a video of a particular family that somebody might consider to be so-called high risk or from a, a low, low resource setting and ask yourself or your colleagues, what's going on? Watch 10 minutes of it. What you hear and what becomes most salient to people are all the things that don't seem so good missing cues, being intrusive, being distracted. Um, and oftentimes, if you ask, especially people who are in training to support families um, to tell you something good that happened, they can't identify it. And there's nothing good happening. This family has really got no skills. This video coaching strategy is able to just break the process of parent-child interaction down sufficiently that you can identify moments when serve and return is happening even in what would be considered to be the highest risk kinds of families. And now having looked at thousands of videos, I can say there are not instances where there is no serve and return detectable. It's, it's a ubiquitous thing. You, it's not surprising. You expect it to be conserved as a species or else we probably wouldn't be around. But adults naturally are drawn to children's behavior exploring the world. And a lot of the question then is, how do you make it salient to people when that's happening, make it apparent to them so that they can do more of it because it's the thing that they're already doing. This is a fundamental shift in our thinking. And really what it came from was the idea that interventions don't need to be about teaching people new skills or having them stop doing things that they shouldn't be doing, but that if you show people what they're already doing, it's going to give them the opportunity to understand it and then potentially to do more of it, which is really reinforcing in and of itself. So that's, the, that's where the intervention came in. One of the things about this approach is that it's sufficiently powerful that it really requires a very light touch. So we went from this massive, complicated program for foster children to a 
a much briefer program over the course of the summer. But the FIND intervention occurs over six coaching sessions where a coach will show the caregiver what they're doing correctly in a period of maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And that's the full span of the intervention. So it really has fundamentally reduced the amount of resources necessary to provide support to caregiver child contexts um, while focusing on what we see as the most core powerful variables that therefore we have the greatest leverage to change. Um, and again, this is where some of the design thinking comes in, that in our ideas about how to develop this program, we were influenced by thinking if we develop another program that takes months and tons of expertise and is really beyond the scope of what anybody is willing to support in terms of the resources necessary, it's going to go exactly where these other programs went. Um, so some of the things that subsequently um, happened in the design of this was that we made the coaching part of this not require advanced degrees. This is a, just a, when the coaching occurs, it's really a narrative of what's happening in the context of the parent-child interaction. And therefore, it really can be done with paraprofessionals, with community ambassadors to do the coaching. And that in and of itself makes it more scalable. So the, um, the intervention, the reason that there are um, six sessions is there's an initial explanation. And then um, following that, there are periods of video collection in between which we focus on one of five elements of the serve and return process. You can see that they unfold in sort of a sequential order. The first one is sharing your child's focus. The next one is supporting and encouraging the child. Um, the third is naming. The fourth is sort of a, when the serve and return process continues and becomes a back and forth interaction. And the fifth is about transitions from when the child's attention shifts from one thing to another. Um, and Again, if you look at the core of a lot of interventions, these are not like brand new things that we invented, um, but they're just ways to focus in on these core processes. Um, the part of what we've done in the context of this approach is to um, develop a strategy for how adults are most likely to be able to absorb information that maximizes the potential salience of what they're seeing. So in the context of an edited film, we'll show people, talk a little bit about what the element is. Then we have three clips. And each clip is shown three times. We show a clip in its entirety. Then we break it down, and we show it in almost a play-by-play -play kind of way. And then we, we play it all the way through again. And we do that for three of these interactions. The interactions are very brief. They last for 10 to 30 seconds. So we're really not showing people a ton, but we're trying to focus in exactly on what we think people should be paying attention to. Um, in the context of developing this program, we have, again, employed as precise a conceptual model as we can. Um, and in particular, what you can see here is what we were, have previously referred to as mediators that the, we're now calling targets that FIND is really designed to impact serve and return interaction. And in particular, that we our hypotheses are that we'll see increased responsiveness, increased instances of the caregiver returning the child serve, that that will have an impact both on, on caregiver outcomes and on child outcomes, including neurobiological outcomes. And that in this case, that we're going to potentially see changes in caregiver neural mediators of, um, of functioning as a result of the intervention. And I'll present a little bit of data about that in a second. Um, and as you can also see, um, we began the process thinking about what we, th what we expected might be variations um, in responsiveness uh, based on the, um, not only how the intervention was delivered, but also based on the, ch the caregiver's own experiences of adversity. Um, the preliminary results that we have suggest nice impacts on um, parental responsiveness, on caregiver stress and, and sense of competence, and child problem behavior. Um, and we have evidence that it's moderated um, by higher ACEs, that is, parents with higher adverse experiences seem to benefit the most. Um, I say this is preliminary because these, the, these uh, initial studies were pilot studies 
they were gearing up for larger scale studies. And we're actually right now on the cusp of being able to um, unblind a number of different RCTs, including one that was done in Denver in collaboration with Sarah Watamura. So in a year, maybe at the next SRCD, I'll be presenting results from that. Um, we also have, um, and again, I, I mentioned that we, we um, have as a, a potentially um, mechanistic factor involved in the intervention that we might be impacting caregiver um, self-control or self-regulation because in the context of the video coaching, we're showing adults instances where they are returning the child serve and oftentimes in doing so, that involves the, the adult waiting to see what's gonna happen next. So our, one of our hypotheses was that the process of this highly salient uh, kind of experience where you're watching and interacting with your child um, and waiting for their serve might be something that impacts uh, the caregiver's own behavioral control. Uh, so we did a, a small pilot RCT um, where we had caregivers either get the intervention or not, and then we had them do um, a, what's called a stop signal task in the scanner, um, which again involves withholding a kind of a primed or pre-primed -primed response um, in response to a stimuli. And what we found in terms of behavior um, was a nice impact on uh, increases in uh, the stop signal reaction time, so greater self-control for caregivers who received um, the, the intervention versus those who didn't. And it was associated with um, alterations that we saw in brain activity in particular regions that were specifically related to motor control um, in the adults who received the intervention. So again, preliminary evidence that's starting to accrue of the ability to achieve similar kinds of impacts but with a much lower dose intervention. The, um, the other piece of this, and I think the, the kind of experimental evidence that we're, we're gonna continue to be able to look at is really gonna be another important piece of the puzzle as we move forward. Um, but the other sort of evidence that we've accrued of where all of this seems to be headed has been in the response an interest in this approach since we developed it and started to implement it. So there's been, and this relates to a question that was kind of, or a, a comment from before. This was designed not to fit in a particular system, but rather to be complementary to systems. Um, and we started with some interest by early Head Start, um, but people in pediatric primary care have said, maybe this is something that could be delivered in the context of an office visit. Um, and people in child welfare came to us and said, we have baby groups for parents that had their children take away, taken away at birth and are having occasional visitations with a group. Could you do coaching in that context? Um, and there have been number, a number of other contexts in which um, in, individual programs um, have really been interested in continuing to, to sort of try this out and try it out on a larger scale basis. Um, we have, because we wanted to be more flexible this time around, not simply thought about the only way to learn about these programs is in the context of large scale RCTs, but rather to be much more sort of planful about how we could accrue a knowledge base over time. And so we've, this is a big buzzword right now, but we have really in, in, invoked a rapid cycle knowledge development approach to the process where we see ourselves as being able to increase rigor over time as the knowledge base accrues, um, but we're not, we haven't jumped just from small scale pilots to large scale RCTs. We're kind of in an intermediate phase for a number of the different contexts where we're doing this work. Um, and this, some of the indication that this seems to be a little bit more on the right track have to do with the, just the, the expansion of the program in the context of these evaluations over the last five years where we've really reached more than three times um, the, the children that we reached through these other approaches over the course of several decades um, and have had rapid ability to train people who are delivering the program. So I think the, the point is really that the process of developing these approaches that have the potential to reach large numbers of individuals um, has to not just be based on kind of our best intentions and um, can't be based on being sort of 
not thoughtful about what is the reality of the, the context, the service context in which these programs can be delivered, that we can develop evidence bases, that we can use the neuroscience to inform the evidence base, um, and that we can design more scalable programs all in one, if that's sort of our intention along the way. If we leave it to chance, the likelihood that we'll just continue to produce what we've been producing in the field, I think, is great. So it's really critical that we do engage in thinking about ways to shift away from that. And I'm going to finish here. But again, what I, what I, I personally um, would like to have discussion about beyond answering any questions is people's thoughts about other ways that we have potential to move the field forward beyond the status quo. That is, if taking existing evidence-based programs and scaling them isn't the answer, whether it's in early childhood education or K through 12 or higher ed, then what are the alternatives and how can we begin to create that reality kind of moving forward? So let me stop and say thank you. And then <laughs> questions and discussion.